Please give a warm uh, MC3 welcome to John Page. Well, it is a joy to be back with you. 14 years, Ed. I can't believe we've known each other that long. And the crazy part is he keeps getting older and I stay just the same, <laughs> not changing at all. Because I don't think his wife's getting any older either. But it is, it is fun to be back with you guys. And I, I look back to a couple years ago, we got to spend some time at that missions retreat. And I, I hope that God has continued some of that journey in your life. He, you know, he kind of works that out differently for all of us. I, I don't know about you, but I know for me, I still look back on some of the things that we talked about and even some of the challenge that you guys as young people uh, shared with me, and I'm still kind of remembering and learning from those, so it's kind of neat. I was actually just looking back at my notes the other day on some of the things we talked about from the Word of God, and it's been fun for me to see, even though we looked at word, God's Word, and I shared God's Word, but God was teaching me at the same time and continues to teach me those same truths. Uh, this morning, Ed, Ed talked about the fact that we're going to be talking about prayer. And I just want to share with you, just to be upfront and honest, I'm, just, I'm sharing with you what God is currently teaching me. This whole thing of prayer and communication, and I've been a follower of Christ for a number of years, but it's something that I don't know that we ever learn completely or ever stop learning. Um, I, I, we had this one gentleman, he since has gone home to be with the Lord, uh, but he was in our Bible study there in South Africa. I was teaching a Wednesday night Bible study uh, pastor friend of mine was planting a church and we would go in and share with the, the midweek small group there and this one gentleman would pray and it was like incredible. He used words that I sometimes didn't even know what they meant, like they were like those really expensive words, those big words, uh, but he, he would talk to God in such, such an awesome way, like the word awesome, not how we use it a lot, but like an awe-inspiring way and I'm like, man, I wish I could talk to God like that, but I don't have those types of words in my vocabulary that I use. But I always felt closer to God when I would listen to Him pray because it was like it was beautiful. It was almost like you were reading a prayer from a book. And yet sometimes I think in my mind I think, okay, that's the way I got to pray. But I realize that's not what God's asking. Like He doesn't sit up there. It's not like a test where He's grading us on how we pray. Like uh, that was kind of mediocre. You know, you're only using like fifty cent words instead of five dollar words. That's not what God's doing when He's up in heaven, is He? And, and so for me, there's a, just a lot of things I just want to share with you, just personally, but there's a lot of things that God has been uh, working out in my life, kind of in this journey of talking to Him. I, and I realized this, that one of the negatives, I think, in my life is disconnecting life from my relationship with God. So sometimes I do that, and, and what that does is that affects my prayer life because I talk to God like He's not real. Or, or maybe I talk to God, but I forget that he's God. Do you know what I mean? And, and you probably don't fall into this trap, but I, my context that I'm sharing with you from is I'm learning this as I'm in, in South Africa. So you're going to have to jump into South Africa in your minds today. So this may not be your context here in Germantown, Maryland. But there, there's, a, there's a young person. Uh, she's actually staying with us this year. She's been a friend of our family for a couple of years. And uh, she's in our intensive discipleship program this year. And we're talking about this whole aspect about talking to God. And we started listening to how we talk to God. And it was one of these situations, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'll pick on her because she's not here. Her name's in Tomi. Actually, if she was here, I would pick on her too. Uh, but Arthur, when, when she would talk to God, it would be like this. It would be like she would be saying, your, your name's Arthur, right? I don't want to call you like the wrong name on that. I'm not going to embarrass you right now. But she would talk, and it would be like, hey, Arthur, it was so good, Arthur, to see you, Arthur, this morning, Arthur, and I'm so glad, Arthur, to be here with you, Arthur, and to hear you play Arthur, the bass guitar, Arthur. We don't talk like that, though, do we? But I realized, like, in the habit, she was constantly saying, like, God, God, and, like, repeating, like, every three words, just, like, readdressing God. And it was almost like she had, like, a bad cell phone connection. Like, are you still there? Hey, God, God, are you still there? Are you breaking up? You know, like before we had the digital networks, you guys remember the analog? Well, you young guys don't. But the older, all, those of us older, we remember like, you know, just kind of break. God, are you, God, are you still there? God, are you still there? And I started laughing because I'm going like, wow, I never thought about that before. But we just started looking, not, not being critical, but looking at the reality. When I talk to Ed, I don't talk that way. So why do I talk to God? Sometimes in a way that I don't really think he's real or he's really, maybe, maybe I think sometimes for me it was that I don't always know that he's listening. You know, because sometimes we understand and we've been taught in church that God listens to everybody, right? God hears all of our prayers. But we're humans and we can't comprehend that. So we picture God up in heaven like with a thousand cell phones going like, 
And we're going like, hey, God, listen to me. God, listen to me. Come back to my cell phone. But that's not who God is because he is God. And so this whole aspect of prayer is interesting. And, you know, some of it, I, I, don't, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to make light of it, but sometimes I have to wonder what God thinks like when I talk to him. Did you ever run into those situations like where, where all of a sudden you're, you're, you're telling God something? Did you ever inform God of something? I, I, you, you know where I'm going with this, right? Because like we inform God of something and then we realize, like, wait a second, he's God. You know, God, I just want to pray for my, sin, my, friend, my friend Sam. You know, God, he's really, he's really struggling with his attitude, God. And God's going like, hello? Of course I know that. I'm God. I know he's got a bad attitude. I'm the one trying to change his heart. It's like we inform God of things because we're like, God, just in case you didn't know this, my sister's been really mean to me all week. And I think you need to zap her with the lightning bolt. <laughs> just take her out of this world and make all of our lives better. And God's going like, yeah, but the problem's not with her heart, it's with yours. So I often wonder what God's thinking when I talk to him. And, and sometimes, you know, and God's not sarcastic, but sometimes we're sarcastic. That's kind of a sense of humor people... People have this sarcasm thing. And so I wonder if God's sitting up there when, when we talk to God and we say, you know, God, because we, we lift other people's needs up to him. We go, no, God, I just really want you to pray for so-and-so's health. Uh, they're, they're really, they've really got this cold. I just pray that they would get over this cold. And God's up there going like, they've got more than a cold. You know, they've got diabetes and high blood pressure and a whole lot of other things that they don't know that's going on right now. So you're praying for that, but I know what's really happening. And, and we try to inform, for me, I, I try to inform God of things. And when I do that, I forget that God is massive. And now, I, I don't say all that to say that God doesn't want to hear from us, because he does. And that's the incredible part. Like, if you ever get to a point where you're talking to God and you literally don't know what to say for someone, you, you look at scriptures and he says the Holy Spirit makes utterances or prays for us to God. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of like a translator. He just words things. He knows the intent of our prayer, and he words that to God for us. I was talking, um, or I was reading actually one guy's book, and it was interesting because he made the comment that uh, at one point in time there was a horrific family situation. Somebody had died, and he just went to be with the family. He said, but I didn't know what to pray. And I just kind of prayed God. He said, I realized with that one word, that was probably the deepest prayer I'd ever prayed because God knew all my thoughts and my desires and my crying out to him for help simply by saying that one word. So this whole aspect is prayer. That's what I want to talk about today. I'm not going to give you all the answers because I don't have all the answers. But what I do know is that God's word has all the answers. And so we're going to look at the aspect of praying locally and also praying globally. And I just, I hope, I pray, I, I ask God that... All of us would get something practical out of our communication with God. So that we can, as he desires to talk to us more, we can talk to him not better to have you know, those long, fancy words, but so we can talk to him in a more real way because he desires that <coughs> of us. And so we're going to look lo locally, but we're also going to look globally and specifically uh, as it comes to missions. And I'm so excited that I happen to be here on, on like your missions day because you guys are doing the car wash and lunch and some awesome things for your missions trip this year. And so hopefully this is going to be very practical for you because if you're going on this trip, this is how you can pray for each other. And if you're not going on the trip, those of you that are not going on the trip, this is the most active thing you can do is to pray. And so I just want to share with you Two main thoughts, and there's going to be five thoughts under the other one, and that's going to get confusing, but it's not a problem. As long as it's not confusing to you, you don't have to worry about what my paper looks like up here. But I want to share with you, first of all, from Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at a number of different passages, but we're going to look at this one passage just for the first thought, and then we're going to go to specifically ask for the prayer as it deals with evangelism. So if you have your Bibles or iPhones or whatever you have to look it up on, it's such a cool day and age where you can have so many copies of God's Word with you in your pocket. Colossians chapter 1. And then we'll look at a couple, a couple of other things after that. And this is, this is what I want to look at, the aspect of prayer 
and how we pray for somebody. If you want to pray for somebody and somebody says, hey, I really want you to pray for me, uh, sometimes we don't always, I, for me, I don't, I'm kind of at a loss, um, and, I, and I want to pray for that person honestly. And this, this actually was just shared with me a couple weeks ago. One of, one of my uh, good friends, he's a missionary, he's a Brazilian, he was a pastor in Brazil, a Brazilian pastor, and he's now in Mozambique, which is kind of our neighbor country. We live about seven hours apart. And we were talking about this aspect of prayer. He shared this with me as far as we were praying for each other. And you know, we often would share prayer requests. How do I pray for you? How do you pray for me? And we would share family and personal. And all those things are really good. And then he shared this scripture passage with us as a team when we were in Mozambique uh, for the week that we were together, how we could pray for each other specifically. And so I want to share this aspect as we pray for each other. And then we'll go right into the aspect of looking at uh, praying for evangelism. Colossians 1, 9 to 12 says this, For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we have not stopped praying for you. A pretty cool aspect, and I think for me, uh, one of the things that God has shown me is the best way I can learn how to pray is to look at what he talks about prayer and examples he gives us of people praying in Scripture. And how do we pray Scripture, but how do we pray the way they pray in this particular situation with Paul? He said, we've not stopped praying for you. We are asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understandings so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. Let's continue with the word of prayer as we look to God's word. God, you're already here with us, and we've already uh, been talking to you, and we're not informing you of anything that you're not aware of, but we're just so thankful that you allow us to communicate with you. And we're so thankful that you communicate to us through <coughs> this collection of words that we refer to as your word or the Bible. And so, Lord, this morning as we have prepared our hearts through being able to worship you with, with singing. And now, Lord, help us to worship you as we look to your word. God, just teach us. Uh, you know in my life, and nobody else here does because they don't know my heart, but you do. You know how much I battle with my communication with you. And, Lord, you know the journey that you've been bringing me on. And I pray even this morning as I share these words that not only would we be encouraged, but we would learn from your scripture some very practical <coughs> things that we can do that we can say in our communication to you uh, for ourselves and for other people. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Colossians gives us a pretty cool outline. And, and I just briefly, we're not going to spend a ton of time in it this morning because I want to just give you an overview and I want to prick your interest as you're going into missions. All of you are going to be connected to this missions team. How do you pray for them? And, and maybe, you, maybe you're, you're caught in that phrase where they say, hey, would you pray for me? Uh, would you help support us as this team goes through financially? But then would you get behind us in prayer? And, and I don't know, I'm a guy. That's an obvious statement, isn't it? I, I, you know, but as a guy, I think as a man, we, we like to do, we like to fix things. We like projects. We like our hands. We like our minds. We're going to solve and we're going to know. And, and, and so there's a tangible outcome. So we see something in front of us and, okay, I have to do this and this, or I work this and this, and then this will be the outcome. I build this and this, and this is the outcome with that. And so for me, I think that's one of the struggles that I have when I tell people, I'm going to pray for you, it becomes this task, right? Which is not a bad thing. Because, Arthur, there's nothing worse than, like, if I were to tell you, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you, or, Michael, I'm going to pray for you, and then I don't do it, that's like a really bad thing to lie about, isn't it? So I don't want to do that. So sometimes when I tell people, I'm going to pray for you, I stop right then and I pray. But then I pray and then I want to pray later on because I know what they're going through. And I, I've not always stopped and thought about what am I actually going to pray for a person. And I love this in here where it says, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually pray for you. And then it, it really gives us actually a pretty complex outline going through. But just real simple, a couple of aspects here. Uh, we're asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his will. You ever pray that for somebody? You ever pray for, for, for Ed, for, for Laura, for your pastor? That you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That's actually a pretty cool prayer, isn't it? 
I know some of you are thinking, well, like, listen, I talked to God and asked him for an iPhone 5 when it comes out. That, that's what I'm praying for. That, that's not bad, I guess, to go with, with that. But sometimes we think of things with our prayer instead of understanding. And, and I realized as Carlos actually is, a, is the missionary's name was sharing this with me, and, and we're talking about this as a team, and I'm going, wow, yeah. I, I need to pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Wouldn't that be incredible? For, for us to be able to pray for that each other. Hey God, as you're as you're on this, as you're as I'm on this journey with you, help me to know your will. Help me to understand your will. And, and even in the context of this of this passage, there were so many false teachers that were coming into the church and they were using a lot of these similar words, and, and he's battling this aspect here of these false teachers, saying, listen, it's not a matter of being filled. It's a matter of being filled with the knowledge of God's will. Matter of fact, it's not even with the aspect of being filled with the knowledge of our will, uh, but, it's, but it's God's will, it's His will for our life. It's not what we want to do, it's what God wants us to do. Because I battle with that, I think it's the same thing, it must be this whole man thing, but maybe you're a planner, you're a project manager, you're, you're a woman, you're a man, and, and that's the way you think, and so you put together this whole package of how your life should look, and you say, okay God, here it is. Is this a good plan? Because that's what we do here on earth, right? We have to do a project at school, we turn into our teachers. Is this a good project? We're at work and we want to get a promotion, so we talk to our boss and we say, is this a good project? Does this look good? And that comes right into our walk with God, where we say, God, okay, I put my life together as a project. Does this please you? And God says, I don't want you to put your life together as a project. I will do that for you. And I want you to live the way I ask you to live. I've already put together the plan for your life. I want you to know it and to live it and to understand it. And so it's pretty cool. First of all, that, that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his, of his will. Uh, secondly, you can kind of look down there, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. To walk worthy of the Lord. What, what an awesome prayer to pray for someone. Next time you say, hey, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that you walk worthy of the Lord. And it's incredible. It says, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Bearing fruit in everything you do and growing in the knowledge of God. That's a challenge for life, isn't it? Am, am I really going to walk worthy of God? Am I going to grow in my knowledge of God? How do I grow in my knowledge of God? How do I learn how to live? How do I do that? We go, hmm, sometimes by accident. No. How do we learn anything in life? We're either taught it or we read it and study it, we teach it ourselves. So if we're going to learn about God, the best place to do that is the Word of God. It's getting into the book. We say, why do we have to get into the book? Well, exactly this, because my prayer for you is that you would walk worthy of God, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. I can't know more about God if I don't study about God. If I can't spend time with God, if I can't allow God to be real in my life. And then the third thing that kind of stood out as a major point there when Carlos was sharing with me was there in verse 11, may you be strengthened with all power. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience. With joy, giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints, in the saints' inheritance in the light. It's kind of an incredible prayer there at the end, there isn't it? It says, may you be strengthened with all power. I'm happy with that. Pray that I would have a lot of power. But it doesn't just stop there, does it? That's not like the end of the sentence. Be, be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Because remember, life is not about us. Life is about God. And so we're asking here in someone else's life that you would be strengthened so that you would bring glory to God in everything that you do, not just in doing church, but in everything that you do. And then it says, for all endurance and patience. Why do you think they were praying for endurance and patience? Were they praying for endurance and patience because life was easy and simple? No. You pray for endurance. Like, I always think of endurance, I always think of, like, these marathon runners. Uh, we, we were at the, the it wasn't a walk -a but the event at school last night. Uh, the Relay for Life. I mean, there's, there were people out there for a 12-hour period that were continually walking, walking, walking. And you know, you didn't have to encourage them at the beginning. But I, we, we joked, we like to go back at like 4 in the morning 
And was everybody still walking? So you don't have to pray for people as they start. You have to pray for people as they endure. And then the whole aspect of patience, obviously there were, there were major battles that were taking place. <laughs> Praying for strength and power that they would have endurance and patience. And then he really throws in those next two words there, with joy. With joy. Joy and happiness being different, but with that aspect of saying, hey, listen, life is difficult, but if I'm doing what God wants me to do, I can have joy in the difficult times because I'm doing it for God and not for myself. When we do it for ourselves, I don't know about you, but when life gets difficult for me, I tend to have a pity party. Woe is me. Oh, man, life is so bad. Let me tell you how bad life is for me today. And I really do. I, I, you can ask my wife, because wives are like the most honest people in the world. You can't fool them. And she'll tell you that when I struggle and my attitude is wrong, it's because I'm looking at me and not looking at God. And so when I ask people to pray for me, to pray that I have strength and power for endurance and patience, that I could do it for God's glory with joy. And so just an awesome way to pray. So j jot that down there if you're taking notes or make a mental note of that Colossians 1, 9 to 12 and dig into that passage or, or pray that passage for somebody else. Pray it for your pastor. Pray it locally. Pray it for your church. Pray it for this church as you reach Germantown, Maryland. With, with God's good news. So incredible, incredible pattern. And I love the fact, right there at the beginning, says we've not stopped praying for you. We pray this for you continually. But I'm so thankful that they also told us what they prayed. So we can copy it. Thankfully, we don't have to think of everything new in life. We can just look at what God's word says and copy exactly what it is. So that's one aspect. How do you pray for somebody? When somebody says, will you pray for me? And you're at a loss what to pray for them. Or maybe they ask you specifically to pray for a request. Pray for that request. And then add this to it. Add these three points right to it. And uh, see what God continues to do in their life as you pray for them in a deeper way. Praying what God desires already in their lives. So pray for each other, first thing. Let's pray for each other, and let's pray for each other specifically as it comes to that relationship with God. And then let's, secondly, let's look at praying for evangelism. And I, I hope this is practical. I hope that first part is practical for you, too, and how to pray for somebody in a, in a meaningful way. But then evangelism. Let's talk about how do we pray for evangelism. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And I'm going to give you, uh, we're going to hit, is it five different things here? Six different things. Um, and I'll hopefully try to help you remember them at the end. But we're going to bounce to some different scripture passages too. So Luke chapter 2, no, sorry, Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Uh, and as we look at missions and evangelism and the fact that you guys are on mission, remember we're talking about locally and globally. Um, so as you think of me in South Africa, you may pray for a missionary in a different country. But also the reality is that you are missionaries right here. Because you're sharing God's word right here, right where you live. Whether it's work, whether it's home, whether it's school, wherever your community is at. So let's, let's pray for this in these six different ways when it comes to evangelism. And I just want to share with you uh, kind of six objects that God gives us in the Bible as it deals with evangelism. Luke chapter 10, verse 2 says this. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great. But laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, we actually could spend the rest of our time right here on this verse because this is an awesome verse. Um, are you familiar with this verse? How many of you have you've heard this verse before? Maybe you've heard it in Sunday school or any connection to missions. You hear this verse a lot, right? You know, my, my challenge when I hear verses a lot is I kind of blow right through them fast. I just go, okay, I've heard this before. I know what it's talking about. Um, but the reality is that Sometimes these verses are simple to read and really hard to live. For me, anyway. I don't know, maybe not for you, but for me, it's kind of a challenge because it says, Then he said to them, Jesus Christ said to them, The harvest truly is great, but laborers are few. And you always hear people talk about that. You always hear pastors, you always hear missionaries talking about, We need more people to be on mission in life to look at other people, to reach them with the gospel. And that's so true. It says, therefore, pray. And I love this. He says, therefore, pray. First thing, pray. So if you're wondering if your work of prayer is really work, 
you know, versus having a project that you, you accomplish or, you know, designing something, building something, solving something, teaching a concept. Sometimes we think of those being more work. The work of prayer is something that God's been challenging me with. Am I really praying, or am I just telling everybody, listen, there needs to be more people on the mission field. You need to be more active in your mission field here. Or am I actually praying for laborers? That's the first thing. Write down, pray for laborers. Pray for people on your team as it comes to you guys specifically with your, with your mission strip. But pray for people, that people would see other people and the need that they have for Jesus Christ. And I love this. He says, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest, because remember, it's his harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. And see, it's not our harvest, is it? He says, pray that people would go out and simply do the job and tell people because it's my harvest. So it's not a matter of going out and telling people and saying, okay, uh, we, we really did a job because we've seen five people become followers of Christ. And that's fine because we like to report back and share, but God says it's, it's his harvest. They've become followers of him, not followers of me as a person. So pray for people to do the work. It's interesting, in the, in the context there, uh, when he shares that, he's getting ready to send out the 70 two by two, send them out in, in pairs. And there was a very specific plan that he had for spreading the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And they were, they were we were talking about this last night, they, they were missional in their focus, right? Because they went out with a purpose and a goal. They weren't just going through life existing. And yet so many times I segment and I say, okay, this is my time to share God, and this is my time for me to study, and this is my time for family. And God says, no, no, I'm sending you out so that wherever you are at, with family, with study, with job, at the car wash today, you are a laborer for me. And it's really simple to understand that because God says wherever there are people, that's the harvest. The, the, the fields are white unto harvest. Like the people, anywhere there's people, you can share. And I know growing up, and, and you may be different than me, but growing up, I never looked at my school as like a harvest field. I looked at my school as like, at school. I, I would play soccer, not very well, but I'd play soccer. And like, the soccer, the soccer pitch was like the enemy. They, that wasn't the harvest. I went there to beat and annihilate and hurt them. I was not going to tell them about Christ. And God says, wait a second, you have compartmentalized me, and now you're praying that there will be a specific labor at a specific event. And he says, and it's not an event, it's life. And so let's look at it that way. As we look globally, as you pray for me, pray for laborers in South Africa. I'm going to share with some of you guys in Sunday school uh, just some, some really neat people that God's brought into our lives and how they are laborers in South Africa telling other South Africans about Christ. But that's the same thing that God wants for us here. He wants to see us do what he's asked us to do. So pray for laborers. Second, turn over to Colossians, the book of Colossians chapter 4. <coughs> Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. Pray for laborers, pray for people. But secondly, pray for opportunity. Pray for opportunity. Let's see what Colossians 4 3 says. At that same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message, to speak the mystery of the Messiah, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in prison. Paul, in the context here, is in prison, which is kind of an interesting place to be. I've never been there before, but interesting, especially with this context, prisons back then were not like prisons today. And, 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 he, and he encourages the followers of Christ to pray for him this way. Pray also that God may open a door for to us for the message. Pray for an open door. Pray for an opportunity. Do, do, you, ever, do, do you ever get to a point where like, you wonder if God's listening? Have, have you ever done that? You talk to God and you're going like, hello God, are you out of airtime? Are you listening? Are you really hearing what I'm saying? And sometimes I struggle with that because I don't always see an answer. And God always gives us an answer when we pray, right? He says yes, no, or wait. So he's always answering. And, and I'm, I'm really fine when God says yes. I'm going like, yeah, God, we're on the same page. When he says no, I'm not so convinced. 
I don't know if you heard me right, maybe I didn't present my case right. I don't like no's. Do you, do you like no's in life? We really don't like no's. But you know what, I, that's still okay because I know it's yes or no. You know the hardest one for me? Is wait. You know, it's like, God, who do you think you are? I only have so much time, can you answer this prayer? And he's going like, I got like millions of years, buddy. I don't know what your timetable is, but I don't run by a watch. I've got like eternity. So I will answer this when I know it's the perfect time and in the perfect way. And so he always answers yes, no, or wait. But when we look at wanting God to answer a prayer, you know what else I've found in my life? Sometimes I pray selfishly. And thankfully, God doesn't give me what I ask for. Because he's protecting me. But this is, this is praying not for me. When I pray for an opportunity, I'm saying, God, would you please... Give me an opportunity to be missional in my approach today and share with someone, encourage someone in their walk with Jesus Christ. And, and the reason I give you that other background, because for me personally, I just want to share a testimony with you that when I pray this prayer, God answers yes. He really does. And, and, and I, I tell you, I could, I could share with you, Literally hundreds of instances when together as a group or even individually, I'll say, God, would you give me somebody to talk to today, to encourage today? I, I, just to share two quick ones with you, uh, my kids and I, my, my kids, like, like uh, Ed said, are not here. They're actually back in South Africa. They start school tomorrow, so they rather that they could be here with me. We do 12 months of school in South Africa. And uh, they're right in the middle of their year. We're going into winter. They're going into summer, but we're going into winter. So they have to start school tomorrow. Uh, but I was with my kids, and we were. This was, this was about two weeks back, two and a half weeks back. And we had gone to a place where my wife was meeting a friend she had gone to college with, like, a long time ago. So we had lunch, and we were chatting. But I said, you know what? Why don't you guys visit? And the kids and I were just going to go walk through the mall. And we had been praying that, you know, as we, as we travel around, God, give us opportunity, because we're here in America, but... Mission doesn't stop because we're in America. And so we want to have opportunity as we're in our course of our day to talk to people about God. And so Christy stays, kids and I, we go walking around, we go walking through the mall. And you know what's so cool here? Apple stores. I love Apple computers. And they have stores in malls here with Apple. Like for me in South Africa, we do it, but it's like all online. You just kind of look and drool. Well, we went to this store and it was massive. And have you ever been to an Apple store? Everybody's wearing like a blue shirt, right? And so I walk in, I can't, actually I can't remember what city it was in, it was, it was somewhere here in the northeast, and we, we walk into this, to, to the mall, we're walking down, and I'm like, CJ, there's an Apple store, let's go see what it is, because what are we going to get? I said, nothing, we're just going to go look. <laughs> and so we walk inside, and there's like, it, it was a big store, I haven't been into a lot of ones, but it was a fairly big store, but there had to be a hundred blue shirts in the store, like a hundred. And do you ever walk in, and everybody wants to talk to you? Hey, can I help you, can I help you, can I help you? They really are helpful, but like, the pride of me goes, no. You can't help me. So somebody said something, hey, can I help you? And I said, actually, we're just kind of looking. And kind of went through, and we started to look at something else. And another guy came up and started talking to us. And they said, hey, can I help you? I'm like, actually, you know what? I'm, I'm not looking to buy anything, but I, I've, got a, I've got a couple questions. And already he's going like, okay, there's no sale here. But I like Apple because they just will talk to you. They'll just talk to you about a product. They like their products. They'll just talk to you. So he says, yeah, what, what's your question? I said, well, let me give you the context because I actually live in South Africa. I don't live here in America. And we have Mac computers there. I love Mac computers. But I, the questions I'm asking you are because I'm in a different country. It's not in the U.S. context. And, and it was interesting because right away I'm talking to this guy. And he goes, oh, why are you in South Africa? <laughs> okay, I have two options at this point. Did, did you ever think a simple question like that? Why are you in South Africa? I can tell him, my job has sent me there. Is that true? It's absolutely true. My job has sent me there. Or I can tell him I am a missionary telling young people about Jesus Christ in South Africa. What do I say? I'm not embarrassed of the gospel, but my tendency would be to say my job has sent me there. That's practically what he's going to understand. But I've been convicted over this on the past year saying, okay, God, I've asked you for an opportunity, and maybe this is the opportunity. And I'll tell you why. This is the worst part. All right? I'm not spiritual enough to pick this out of my own. My wife looked at me, and she told me at one point in time, and it was in a different conversation, she said, why didn't you tell him more specifically about what you did? Are you embarrassed about what you do? No. I'm not embarrassed about it at all. So why didn't I tell him? 
maybe I was embarrassed about it. Maybe I wasn't sure where that conversation would go. Maybe it would get awkward, and so I didn't say it. Why should I be awkward about the gospel? And, and, and especially for me, because you're going like, yeah, you're a missionary. You get paid to tell people about Jesus Christ. Like, you shouldn't be doing it. Shame on you. But shame on all of us sometimes when we, when we kind of duck and dive. And so I'm talking to this guy, and he says, why are you in South Africa? And I said, well, I'm actually in South Africa, and my son and daughter are there with me too, so we're doing this as a family. I said, and we're there as missionaries uh, working with local churches, and we, we teach young people the Bible. And he goes, that's so cool. I've been to Zambia. Okay, there's a hundred blue shirts in the store, and I mentioned to a guy that I'm in South Africa. Like most people, I'll just be honest, because I didn't know this either seven years ago. Most people think like South Africa is like Southern Africa. They don't know it's an actual country. And that's not bad, because I didn't either. I was a really bad American when it came to my world history, and so I had to realize all those things once I got there. Uh, but he had not only known South Africa, but he had been in Zambia, which is a country that also speaks English, and it's only two countries from us. You go through Zimbabwe and Zambia, or Botswana and Zambia. It's right there. And as nice as we have things in South Africa, in the context of Africa, Zambia is very rustic. Like if you think of the bush of Africa, that's Zambia. And so now my, I have another opportunity, right? I can go, wow, that's cool. But now I want to know, why did you go to Zambia? Because <laughs> you, you know why a lot of people go to Zambia? They go on safaris. You can go hunting animals. You can pay big dollars to be able to go have an African experience. And he says, I went with my church. And I'm going, wow. This is cool. This is some interesting connections. Out of 100 blue shirts in an Apple store that I've never been to, in a city I visit once every three years, I talk to the one guy who's been to the continent I live on, and he went there because of a church. God answered that prayer of an opportunity to share with someone. Got to find out what church he went with, why he went, does he know Jesus Christ? Is he going to Africa for an experience? Is he going to share with other people? And here's a young man who actually wants to go back. He's getting his um, degree in physical therapy, and he's got a friend who's getting a degree in computer science, and they want to go back to Zambia to specifically work with the local missionary and helping the young people. He said, I went in and saw soccer there. He goes, and we're doing soccer, and I love soccer, but he's like a physical therapist, so like, you know, like you're one of those smart people, you do soccer, you stretch and warm up your muscles, right? He said, they looked at me like I was from Mars. They had never seen someone do that before you played soccer. Like, how do you take care of your body? He says, I realize, I know that my body is fearfully and wonderfully made, but here was a group of people that didn't even understand how to take care of the muscles in your body and that they were created by this awesome creator who wants us to take care of them, and I could use that knowledge to share with them Jesus Christ. So it's one, of, it's one of these prayers that, that is incredible when you say, God, give me someone. And that day, he didn't give me someone that, did, that wasn't a follower of Christ to share with. He gave me somebody who was a follower. I said, listen, I know this is really weird, but here, take, take my, my phone and email yourself so I'll have your e you'll have my email address. I said, because I want to talk to you because what I want to do is I want to encourage you to come back to Africa. You've been there once and you want to come again? I said, that gets so excited. I said, and if you come, you're going to fly through Johannesburg? I said, just call me up and you can come to our house. You can spend a day or two. I want to encourage you as you take this journey to be on mission in Zambia for Jesus Christ. And you get an email later, it's like, wow, I can't believe I talked to you today. And he's going like, of all the customers that I talked to today, I meet a guy who actually lives on the continent that I want to go to. And he's thinking the same thing. But that's opportunity. God, give me an opportunity i tell you one more, and we're, we're going to be flying on time here. I was with a group of young people when we were down in Cape Town, and we prayed with the group that God give me someone to share Jesus Christ with. And we finished, we sent out, I was leading the group, so you're, I'm the strategist. So I'm sending out two by two, you have this street, you have this street, you have this street, you do this, you don't do this, you go here, you don't go there, here's the time. Get everybody sent out, and I turn around and there's a guy in a wheelchair. Not unusual in Africa. And usually the first question out of their mouth is, hey, I need some money for food. People begging on the streets, very common. He might not even have needed the wheelchair, but they would use a wheelchair because it's part of the app and you would have more sympathy. Now, to tell you the end of the story, he did need the wheelchair, he could not walk, and he didn't ask me for money. He said, what are you doing with all the young people here today? Opportunity. I can say, um, we're just going to visit some people. Or I can say, we're here to tell people about Jesus Christ. 
How do I take that opportunity? God gave it to me. That was one of the weird ones because we prayed that like five minutes before. So it was really obvious. I couldn't miss it. You turn around and you go, oh, this is my opportunity. My opportunity is out there. No, my opportunity came to me in a wheelchair. Got to stop and share with him about Jesus Christ. He knew about God, had never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and had a chance to pray and encourage him and talk to him about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Pray that prayer. Matter of fact, pray that prayer for me in South Africa. Pray that God would give me opportunities to share about Jesus Christ. But let me challenge you with this today. How many of you are doing the car wash today? How many of you guys are doing the car wash today? You're like, listen, I know where you're going on this. I'm not raising my hand, okay? You know what? Think about this. Today, say, God, don't just give me cars to wash. Give me someone to talk to and have a purpose in my conversation about Jesus Christ. Today, at the car wash. How many of you are scared to talk to people? You're shy. I'm scared to talk to people, okay? Raise your hand. Are you shy? Are you scared to talk to people? Okay. We can all relate to that. You say, you're up front preaching. You're not shy. I am scared to death to be in front of people. It's because of the sake of the gospel that I ask God to help me over my shyness to talk to people. Did you ever meet somebody who's not shy? Your, your boys, I met your boys, are awesome. They're just not shy. They're just going to go up and talk to them. I wish I was like that, but I wasn't. So if you're shy... Welcome to the Shy Club. I'm the captain of the Shy Club. Let's pray, God, give me someone today and help me not have a heart attack when I talk to them. Because it's going to be really scary. But ask God that. Say, God, give me an opportunity. Second thing, and I love this. Did, did you realize where Paul's at? Remember he said he's in prison? You're going, dude, he's in prison. He's locked to the guard. Back then it wasn't like these nice cells where you had TV and exercise time. He's locked to the guard. Do you think Paul already had an opportunity? Well, yeah, in our ideal mind, we think he had a captive guard. He could share with them all day long. But he's praying for the opportunity. Because you have no rights as a prisoner. And so he's saying, how do I talk to this man who if I do something wrong would just kill me? How do I share the gospel? God, give me opportunity in the conversation to share. And then it goes on in the next verse there in verse 4 to do it clearly. And sometimes I'm afraid because I'm like, I'm not going to do this really good. So I better not do it so I don't mess it up. Well, ask God to help you with the clarity. Don't let that be an excuse from Satan not to share your life with somebody else. So pray for laborers, number one. Two, pray for opportunity. Three, and we've got to pick it up here on the page, sorry. I get excited just because I've seen how God has changed uh, some areas, he's changing areas of my life with this. All right, this is the next one, because those of you, who was all shy and scared? Raise your hands again, who was shy and scared? Okay, we're part of the Shy Scared Club. This is for us, number three. Acts chapter four. Acts chapter four, verse 29 to 31. Now, Lord... Look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. At the moment of salvation, what happened here at Pentecost, at the moment of salvation, God gives us the Holy Spirit. We have all of the Holy Spirit. We don't need more of them. We have all of them, 100%, day of salvation. So God says we can ask for boldness. God, I'm scared to death. That's one of those informative prayers. God's going like, I know how scared you are. <laughs> I really do. But it's okay. He doesn't mind us telling him that. We're admitting what he already knows. God, I'm scared to death. Give me boldness, something that I don't naturally have to do what you naturally want me to do in sharing about Jesus Christ. God, give me boldness. So today, uh, you're praying for laborers. I mean, we're talking globally here with missions overall, but today the mission field is the car wash. Tomorrow, mission field is the <coughs> school. God, pray for laborers. Okay, let me share with you. God already answered that because you're the laborers. God has called all of us to be on mission. Second, pray for opportunity. God's kind of given us some opportunities that we see coming up. And so, so God... Help me to be able to talk to someone, like with words, not just in concept. Um, let me talk to somebody and help me have boldness to do it because I'm scared to death. Pray for boldness. God says ask for boldness. He's given us the Holy Spirit that will help us with boldness. Pray for success. This is the fourth thing. Pray for success. 2 Thessalonians 3.1 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified. Pray that God's word would run swiftly and be glorified. See, when you're praying for success, you're not praying for your success. God, the Lord of his harvest. You're praying that God would have an awesome harvest. So you're not praying selfishly. You're saying, God, I really want to see people change and follow you. That's success. Pray that people's lives would change. That not only would they hear, that's those opportunities that you share with asking for God's boldness, but that they would change because of what they hear. So pray for success. Uh, right there, too, in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, it says, "In that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Pray for safety. The fourth thing, pray for success. The fifth thing, pray for safety. Um, the context that I live in in South Africa, the number one thing I tell people to pray for in safety is traveling on the roads. People do not follow rules in Joburg when it comes to driving. Not like America where people, and you say, oh, there's some bad drivers here. There are not bad drivers here compared to South Africa. You pray for safety. But it's not talking about just that aspect. It's talking about the fact, do you realize that if people are not followers of God, they are followers of Satan? And Satan doesn't like God. You're going like, duh, obviously. You know, that's the whole conflict that's happening here in the world. Okay, so Satan doesn't want you to have opportunity to share. So you're walking out and you're, you're scared of fear and shyness, but there's a whole spiritual warfare that's taking place. And so when they're praying for success, that God would have success in reaching people through his gospel message that he's using us to communicate, pray for safety, that unreasonable and wicked men would not stop the work of God. Uh, when you go on your mission trip, guess what? Not everything is going to work right. And a lot of times we like to blame that on people because it doesn't work right. And we're going, no, it's not people. It's Satan. He doesn't want this to work right. So pray for safety and protection. Pray for salvation, the sixth thing. Pray for salvation. 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4 says, First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. I love that. For kings and all those who are in authority so that they may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're uh, Chinese, Korean, European, South African, Dutch, German. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're like these wealthy country rulers, kings, or if you're like uh, you're like the trash man. It doesn't matter where you're at. God says, I want salvation to be for everyone. So when we go out, God wants us to share it with who? People that come in with a sign that say, share the gospel with me. People that initiate the conversation with us. No, God wants us to share this with everyone. You're going, yeah, but you don't know how mean some of my friends are. I, I don't. But I had friends like that, and I didn't share with them, and I regret it to this day. Because God says, I want this to be for everyone. So pray that people would understand the gift of salvation and that they would choose to follow Christ. So real quick, in review, pray for laborers, pray for opportunity, pray for boldness, pray for success, pray for safety, and pray for salvation. I, I hope that that's what you pray for us in South Africa as missionaries. I hope that's what you pray for your pastors. I hope that's what you pray for yourself. Because it doesn't matter what our occupation is. God has all of us on mission today as we look to people. God gives us people, not events. He gives us people to share the gospel with. I, I love, I, we stay connected to America quite a bit, but I'm still pretty disconnected. So, like, I come back and I turn on the radio, and there are awesome Christian radio stations. Like here in Maryland, I'm listening to music coming down the road yesterday, and I, I, I heard this song. It's not a new song to me, um, but I, it really challenged my heart uh, because it's one that I've heard since I've been back in America. And I really think if we live, if we, okay, I don't want to generalize, if I lived the way I sang, I would live differently. 
This is the words to the song. Sometimes I just want to close my eyes and act like everything's all right when I know they're not. This world needs God, but it's easier to stand and watch. I could say a prayer and just move on like nothing's wrong. But I refuse. Because I don't want to live like I don't care. I don't want to say another empty prayer. I refuse. I refuse to sit around and wait for someone else to do what God has called me to do myself. Oh, I could choose not to move, but I refuse. I can hear the least of these crying out so desperately, and I know that we are the hands and feet of you, oh God. So if you say move, it's time for me to follow through and do what I was made to do to show them who you are. An old quote, nothing new, powerful song, but the quote says, work like it all depends on me and pray like it all depends on God. God, you are awesomely mighty, powerful, you're God, and sometimes we just have to get together and talk to you and acknowledge what you already know. But God, if I lived the way you want me to live, knowing how you want me to live, I would live differently, and you know that, because you're taking me on this incredible journey, and you're changing me, you're changing my life, and God, help me just to become so passionate about you that I stop making excuses because I'm scared or I'm afraid or I don't know what to say or I might not be clear. Help me to refuse to make excuses. God, just like that song, you, you must have done an incredible work in that guy's life for him to write a song like that, to stop making excuses. Lord, help me just to be obedient to you today. In Jesus' name.